Disclaimer, real life Norway sounds like a really cool place to go. So this actually isn't my script. This is by Bogdan M underscore 87 who posted it on the Civ subreddit and it's super extensive and I really wanted to make a video about it because he made some very good points. So definitely go down the description below and give him some love because this is an awesome post. He probably spent at least two hours uh, filling this whole thing out, maybe even more because this is very extensive. It goes super in depth as you'll see here. And he honestly deserves a whole lot of credit. So go down and give him some upvotes in uh, the description on Reddit here. And it'll probably help him out a lot. Let's get right into it. Norway definitely sucks in the current Civ 6 update. It's not very polished. It's not very competitive at all to other Civs in general. So let's talk about some stuff that makes it this way. And let's talk, talk about some stuff that can improve it. So the Stave Church is probably the weakest unique building in the entire game. It is exactly the same as the regular temple coming in the late classical era. Its position on the civics tree is problematic. As bealing it means you have to skip out an early empire which hurts your expansion, military tradition which hurts your combat effectiveness, and political philosophy which hurts basically everything as this is a crucial civic. Once you do get it though, what do you get in, in addition uh, to the standard temple? Well, almost nothing. Woods provide one faith bonus instead of 0 .05 for adjacency. This means that at most you get an extra three faith per turn instead of the usual or an extra three faith, so six instead of the usual three from a holy site. So completely surrounded by woods, your holy site uh, had one or two mountain tiles next to it, the extra faith would be even less. Assume you build three or more holy sites in your normal locations, one next to four woods, one next to three woods, and one next to two woods. You would get a total of eight extra faith per turn. Eight faith per turn in the late medieval era is almost nothing, and the only use you could have for it would be once you research theocracy, all the way in the Renaissance, which is a while. And after that, you have to purchase combat units with faith, so you have to use it almost as currency. There's the option of buying campus and theater square districts buildings with faith, but that's probably iffy at best, iffy strategy at best. Um, and you have to have that particular belief. And you can also get uh, apostles that heals all your units, or maybe buying a great person earlier with faith, which are both viable, but those are rare and weak as well. Just consider what you gave up. The opportunity cost of building four holy sites that grant you an extra eight faith. You could have built campuses with universities, commercial hubs with at least markets and trade routes or industrial districts with workshops, all of which grant you meaningful bonuses and great person points, something the holy site does not. In short, the state of churches are basically holy sites that are a little bit easier to use, and they can be easily bypassed if you are smart about your placement of your districts and how you build your cities. What makes an awful situation worse is that Norway has no way of being better than other civs at getting religion. China can rush build Stonehenge with their uber workers or they can chop forge to rush holy sites. Egypt can hard build Stonehenge faster, particularly when they get the Monument of the Gods Pantheon thanks to their Sphinx or it can be hard built holy sites next to rivers uh, that come up 15% faster. Scythia can get the Monument to the Gods to get Stonehenge faster thanks to Kurgan, but they'd have to be stupid to go down that route, but it is still an option. Russia and Japan can both build Holy Sets in half the time. Greece can use the Great Prophet card before getting Political Philosophy in their Special Wild Card slot. Poland can use the Great Prophet card before getting Political Philosophy in their Special Wild Card slot. Arabia is guaranteed the last great person in the game, and Aztecs can rush through the Holy Sites with their enslaved workers. Almost half of all the civilizations in the game can get a religion faction in Norway every single time if they wanted to, making the Staves Church even more situational than it already was, not mentioning that if for whatever reason you don't have woods on the map, you're completely screwed. So it all boils down to crippling your entire development, making a massive gamble that you actually are able to get a religion before knowing who the other civs are, just so your holy sites suck less, only so you can at best get a couple more units out in the Renaissance. Staves Church is pathetic. Even if you could be built for free, which it isn't, it costs the same as a regular temple, it would still be pathetic compared to what other civs are getting. So the Berserker is their special unit, so it uses one less movement to pillage tiles, has four movement if the unit starts in enemy territory, and he has two movement otherwise. He has 40 base combat strength, and he has seven, one, plus 7 combat strength when attacking and minus 7 when defending. He doesn't require any special resources, but he does cost 180 production and 3 gold per turn for maintenance. He also requires military tactics and cannot be upgraded from a swordsman. Like the Stave Church for unique buildings, the Berserker is probably the worst unique unit out there. 
it comes in super late on military tactics, which is a way out of the way as far as techs get, and it's inferior to a swordsman after the Aussie patch, let alone a knight. Swordsman has 40 strength and costs 90 production, and 2 gold maintenance. Basically, you can get exactly 2 swordsmen for the cost of 1 berserker. So, the unit basically sucks. Compared to a knight, the berserker costs the same and is the same level as a tech tree. The berserker attacks at 47 strength and defends at 33. The knight attacks at 48 strength and the berserker moves at 4 under special conditions. The knight moves at 4 at all times. Unless it's absolutely impossible for you to get an iron anyway, there's no reason to build a berserker. So the viking longship. Compared to the galley, 5 extra strength, 1 extra movement, and 1 less gold maintenance can pillage coastal tiles. On most maps, the, mass major the vast majority of cities will either not be on the coast at all, or only what border one or two coastal tiles if you're smart. So this means that you can't prevent cities from healing with naval units alone. Given this, taking cities with a longship is impossible. At best, they are a minor complement to a land army you have. You have to sail all the way to your opponent and can attack the city from one side. What are they good for though? Getting an extra bit of gold from raiding, with costing no maintenance and the ability to pillage coastal tiles, they should, in theory, give you a leg up over your opponent. What happens though, is that you've spent a good deal of production building them, almost always more than what you would get in return, only to find that your opponent has planted a couple archers over the coastal tiles that you want to pillage, making the whole effort basically pointless. So Norway's ability is NAR, so Nor Norwegian units gain the ability to enter ocean tiles after researching shipbuilding. Naval melee units heal in neutral territory, and units ignore additional movement costs from embarking and disembarking. That last part is really good. But since shipbuilding is in the late classical era, the same time as catapults, the best that NAR offers is the minor chance of catching a good offshore island spot, if there even is such a thing, and getting a settler there first. So how good is Norway on naval maps? Well, even on naval maps, Norway is still weak, only slightly less so. China has a better economy from the start. Germany can snowball given the chance and has U-boats. Japan is better at everything near the coast. England gets the cheap harbor and free expanding unit, which is a whole lot better than 8 Faith. India, which also gets more faith just for meeting other civs, can grow large cities without the need for many farm tiles, and has the Varu, which is handy confined spaces, and Congo has the same thing for huge cities, and that's just to name a few. Pretty much every civilization has some way of kind of getting around Norway's pros. So what can be done about Norway? Well, first thing is he proposes that we put the Berserker and the Viking Longship into one single unit, and he calls it the Viking Warband. When it's embarked, it acts as a Viking longship, and when it's on land, as a berserker. The Norse aren't that big on early navies anyway, developing them many centuries after the uh, Polytians and Greeks and Romans and Arabs have done, and so on and so on and so on. This doesn't have to come in at sailing, as for a place to put this in, maybe naval tradition civic would be a good idea in the early medieval or even military training in the late classical, even though that's a little bit late. It'd be a great place to have uh, the same levels like the swords in, maybe. Give the Viking Warband the same amount of combat strength, production cost, and upkeep as the Swordman, but with the Berserker bonus slash mauls for the attack and defense of the other traits, uh, movement, pillaging, embarking, all that kind of stuff, while it's embarked, it would have the same combat stats as the Viking Longship, and it would benefit from the plus 50% bonus for either melee or naval units when constructing. This would give a player playing Norway tons of flexibility, allowing them to switch from sea to land with ease, but that's not all. It's a great unit to think about, and it could literally be overpowered in some ways, but he wants to actually do more to make Norway very, very meta. So, the Norse were actually a really big trading civilization in real life, so replicate this into the game. Let's give the Viking Warband the following traits. So, one, they can act as naval trade routes before the Renaissance era towards foreign civs, and two, they can settle coastal cities on foreign continents at least 20 tiles away from your capital. So, regarding number one, it would not increase the trade route cap you usually have, and it could only be used to trade with foreign cities or city-states. Given that a Viking warband would already cost two gold upkeep, the amount gained through spamming them of trade routes would be somewhat reduced, so it wouldn't be super imbalanced, but it would still be substantial. And then, number two, you could have an actual set, uh, settler maybe cost a small yet increasing amount of gold, but not so much that it's no longer an attractive option compared to a regular settler, especially considering coastal tiles are generally inferior, having it increase the cost of building additional settlers, like settling uh, cities currently does, 
and have it lower the population of the city where the Viking warrior was built so they actually have to leave and you would get a decrease in population and then you actually found a new city. So with the changes presented here today, the Norway player would have some hard choices but it would also foster flexibility and a different playstyle. And he goes on to talk about like a meta and a playstyle and everything that he would use in this fictional Norway. But I'm not going to get into that because it's going to be too long of a video as it is. So I hope you guys go down in the description below and check out that Reddit post because it does go on for another few paragraphs and it's actually a very interesting read. So go ahead down there and check them out if you guys are interested. And if not, I hope you guys had an awesome day. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, go ahead and like, like, dislike, dislike. Then go down in the comments down below and tell me why you rated it like you did. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Oh,